Good. Are there any announcements? Staff appreciation luncheon tomorrow at noon. Please bring food if you're not staff, and please attend if you're staff. Right, Justin? If you're not office staff or email staff, bring food. Great. Thanks. Okay, our seminar speaker today is uh, uh, Jose Pablo Dundor Arias, uh, Arias who's uh, typically known uh, by his friends as JP, and uh, he has a nice pedigree at Iowa State. He got his undergraduate degree at the University of Costa Rica and uh, came here um, with a group trip to Costa Rica in 2006 and later came back in 2008 to get his master's with Gary Monkhold. Uh, he left in 2011 and then uh, went on to Madison for his PhD with Gary Barak. And that was kind of uh, a, a little uh, towards the microbiology or the safe, food safety microbiology side. And then uh, uh, it's been postdocing with Linda Kinko at the University of Minnesota uh, for the last several years. So uh, it's all yours, JP. Welcome back. Thanks, Mark, for the nice introduction. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It's so nice to be back here and see so many familiar faces. Um, it's really been, uh, I really enjoyed not only the weather, but also uh, getting to, to meet with all of you <coughs> again. Um, I, I did a tall the, during the lunch uh, that I had with, with the students, I was telling them that I definitely wasn't thinking when I left Ames many years ago that I was going to be back here meeting with those people that were, that I met as faculty, as instructors and mentors to me, that I was going to eventually meet in a, in a more um, colleague kind of, kind of um, situation. And I've, I've been really enjoying now that I'm not taking tests. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> you get to learn a different side of, of those faculty, trust me. But uh, so Mark invited me, or when Mark, Mark asked me to, to come, he asked me to give you a kind of broad overview of some of the work that I've been doing since I left. Um, ISU mainly focusing on uh, some of the research on multitropic interactions in the phytobiome and how they influence food safety and um, agriculture production. So as Mark briefly mentioned, and, uh, uh, I came, the first time I came to Ames was in 2006 as part of the ISU UCR intercambio. Um, and then in 2007, as Adam nicely reminded me uh, this morning, um, actually I, I was part of the, the group hosting the Gringos that when they were in, in Costa Rica that year. Um, in the end, I just want, I know all of you, most of you are familiar with this, with this program, but I just wanna emphasize this part of, this is a paper that Mark and his colleagues published last year but it says that the, they run a survey with all the participants that they have over the years. It said the participants indicate that the intercambio had a strong impact in the academic and career choices of 77% of the high school students and 100% of the UCR students, including myself, definitely. Um, but more importantly, it has also an impact amplifying the interest in the other country in raising cultural understanding tolerance. That tells you some of the, the big and broad impact that this program has. And for that, I would always be grateful to, to Mark because he really was the, the person who opened all the opportunities for me for me to um, continue in this, to actually consider and continue working in this in this uh, area. So then I worked with Gary, um, joined his lab in, in as a master's student where we worked on integrated pest management of um, soybean seeds. Um, we work on a, pro um, on a project where we're looking at interactions between two soybean viruses, soybean mosaic virus and bean pod monovirus, with the fungal pathogen Pomopsis um, logicola, causing uh, the cousin agent of Pomopsis CDK. And the interactions at the same time with, with the vectors of the, the two virus uh, uh, pathogens. And at the end of, as part of, just as a summary of this project, this Probably you all remember what I told you during my exit seminar <laughs> eight years ago. Um, at the end, we were we found that um, an IPN program based, um, combining insecticide and fungicide applications based on plant phenology and insect po uh, population thresholds um, 
actually had an impact in the dispersal of the pathogens in the field and uh, increased seed uh, health based on uh, redu reducing the, um, the, uh, the infection with these pathogens. As Mark mentioned, then I moved to Madison where I worked with Jerry Morak and Russ Groves. In this project, when I restudied the epiphytic survival of the human pathogen Salmonella enterica in association with um, Phytophagus insects. So, just to give you a brief overview, the CDC estimates that every year there are more than 9 million cases of foodborne illness in the US. And in one of their studies, they found out that 50% of the cases, of illness cases that happened between 1998 and 2008, were linked to contaminated products, meaning fruits, vegetables, or nuts. And just in the last few years, there have been several outbreaks associated with contaminated products, including, including an ongoing uh, outbreak uh, associated with contaminated romaine lettuce. Traditionally, animals have been um, recognized as the main reservoirs and carriers of this pathogen, as well as insects that, have, um, that are associated with on sanitary or, or dirty um, conditions. Uh, they are recognized also as, as vectors. But what we hypothesized in this project was, what happened when we, we know that the produce or plants are getting, could be uh, contaminated in the field. What happened with this Phytophagus insects, meaning those insects that feed on um, plants? That might be uh, that might interact with the pathogen that is already present in the field, and what have, what is the result or the outcome of that interaction as they are feeding or wandering on uh, plants in the field? So for that project, I studied the interactions of the Salmonella with these three main pathogens of uh, insects: Acerola coprids, green peach aphids, and western flower thrips, because they are pests. Um, of crops that have been associated with major outbreaks um, with uh, someone up. So, in uh, but so the, the first question that we had was how does the, the can they actually the interaction with these insects influence the survival of the pathogen in um, the, the, the survival of the pathogen on the, the, the plant surface? So what we found, and I apologize if the, the image is not clear, but what we found is that there was a higher population of the, the, the presence of the insect that actually extended the survival of the pathogen only. So we, we inoculate plants with salmonella, we let insects to feed on those plants, and then we look at the areas that were fed upon by those insects. And, and using GFP uh, tag uh, salmonella, we were able to see in those areas that were fed upon by the insect, that there was the fluorescent bacteria was present in those areas. This also gave us the idea that even though these kind of lesions might be uh, not not be seen as a major uh, quality defect for for all of us as consumers, they might actually represent big reservoirs for this pathogen as a way that they allow, uh, create um, an entry point for the pathogen to access either nutrients that are released from the feeding, um, feeding damage or to get into the in, inside of the, of the plant. Because rem remember that this human pathogen doesn't have the traditional um, mechanisms to, uh, to, um, to infect, it's not a plant pathogen, so it doesn't have the mechanisms to create wounds or get inside of the, of the, the plant by itself. Then as part of that project, what we also found was that the, the insects were also becoming contaminated with the pathogen upon exposure to a contaminated plant. And you can see there was also fluorescent bacteria attached to different parts of the heads, the thorax, and the tails, different parts of the abdomen. And then 50% of the insects became contaminated after 24 hours exposure to a contaminated plant, after feeding on a contaminated plant. So that led or is motivate our next set of questions to say, well, you, we know that they get contaminated. On a dirty surface, you're gonna spread the dirt on your shoes, right? So that, that wasn't really the, 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 the major finding. But what we really wanted to test was whether that um, 
the contamination was limited only to the outside of the insect or whether the bacteria was also being ingested. So we use different, um, uh, different method of protocols from the traditionally being used for uh, vector biology studies when we put insects either contaminated plants or contaminated liquid diets in a way that the, they were not allowed or the, the, the external exposure of their insect body to the diet was limited. So we were able to see that when we had, when insects were fed, uh, had access to being in contact with the contaminated surface and became contaminated 70% of the, uh, they transmitted the pathogen to 70% of the non-inoculated uh, diets. When they ingested the pathogen, but then they were allowed to get in touch with a contaminated surface, there was a still, the, their transmission was reduced 40%, showing that there is a big significant part of that external contamination that plays a role here. But still, it was 40% of the, the, the not contaminated diet became, uh, where we were able to isolate salmonella. And more interesting to us was that 20% of the insects that were fed liquid diets through paraffin sachets that didn't allow access to their body, they were still, they were ingested, they were acquiring the, the pathogen, ingesting it, and transmitting that internalized bacteria that they carried inside. So that uh, suggests that these insects might not only play a role as mechanical vectors transmitting um, bacteria that is attached to their body, but they might also play a role as uh, biological vectors, whether it is transmitting bacteria inside or whether their secretions or, or excreta might be actually um, be a source of, of the pathogen um, after uh, acquisition. So the next set of, of question was to look at the, at the, the excreta of the insect. And I will never forget when I had a student that I interviewed and I was trying to sell this project because she was an REI and, she said, and I explained how I went to, I was getting my PhD and she said, you went, you've been to, you went to school 11 years to end up studying insect poop. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's exactly what I want you to be doing. <laughs> um, but it was really interesting to us because this insect, if you remember when I mentioned that some of the insects that I worked with were uh, hemipteran insects that when they feed on a plant, they secrete a large amount of honeydew. So they poke the leaf and they, it's almost like opening a faucet. They uh, get all the plants up going through their body and they're uh, at the same time excreting this uh, sugar rich uh, um, honeydew. So what we were able to see is that 50% upon after feeding on a contaminated diet, 50% of the insects were contaminated, which again, they were feeding on something that was contaminated, so 50% of them were contaminated, not really surprising, but actually showing that the transmission is not 100% effective. It's not that all the bacteria that they were acquiring, they were um, excreting it. So there was some bacteria that was dying inside of their body, or some bacteria that was actually not making it inside of them. But after they fed on a contaminated diet, still, and then were fed two non-contaminated diets for periods of 48 hours, and still 20% of the insects were, uh, the, the honeydew of, the, of these insects was contaminated. So we were able to isolate salmonella from the honeydew, suggesting that this, um, actually, insect excreta might be a source of the pathogen if they feed on a contaminated source. And in other, in separate studies, we were able to, to show that actually salmonella can use the honeydew as a nutrient source. Um, and actually, the, the, and also the, the survival of the pathogen on leaves that have uh, large amounts of, of, of honeydew um, from insects feeding on them also uh, extended the survival of the pathogen on the leaf surface. So the last, the last set of questions that we had was, okay, we know that they get contaminated, they can transmit it, they can excrete it, but where exactly does the bacteria go 
we know that it survived the passage through the alimentary canal, but where exactly it goes inside of the insect. And doing some, um, a lot of insect dissections, we were able to see that actually the bacteria follows the, the, um, the path of the, the, the plant phloem going from the, imagine this is the insect head, so it goes through the, um, the mouth part to the, the foregut, going to the micar, the, the anterior micar, the posterior micar, and then ex 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 exiting through the hind gut with, with colonies or aggregates of the bacteria that will serve different parts of the alimentary canal of these insects. So that was kind of, uh, as a summary, we were able to see that these insects might, can play a role in um, the epidemiology or, or the the biology of the, the, or the survival of these pathog human pathogens on contaminated leaves. We, we were not claiming that they are major vectors or they might be the main source, but if they, uh, the pathogen is already in the field and they uh, get in, or come across or, or, or find the pathogen on, on the leaf where they're feeding, they might also influence either the survival or the transmission of the pathogen. <coughs> So now, switching gears very drastically, then I went from Madison to Minnesota, where I no longer studying human pathogens, it's much easier to be working not in a BSL-2 facility <laughs> anymore. Um, and I, where I've been working with Linda Kinko for the last couple of years as part of my NSF fellowship, and I've done two different projects that I, um, show you today some of the results, including this one where we look at what are the, uh, we're investigating the ecology and coevolutionary biology of antibiotic producing bacteria in, um, in the soil, and what are, and how management practices can actually influence the phenotypic um, shift, or, or actually shift the, 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 or select for a specific phenotypes of this bacteria in response to this case of carbon amendments. So when I talk about carbon amendments for this particular project, I'm talking about food for the microbes, so sugar sources that we are using to feed the, the microbes. We are not using uh, cover crops or any kind of plant residue to, the, to, to mix in the soil, but instead what we are, we, the work that we've been doing is with, with actual um, specific carbon compounds that, are, that, have, that, that have been identified also in plant root exudates. So as part of the objective of this, this project is again to look at the effect of soil amendments on uh, with carbon substrates on nutrient use profiles and antibiotic and inhibitory interactions among the streptomyces um, prone agricultural soils with the idea that can, to see if we could actually find the conditions that drive the populations to select for better competitors and better inhibitors of pathogens. So just as an as a overview, the idea is that we could identify the conditions that, or some of the work that has been done before has shown that nutrient competition leads to antagonistic interactions, right? So if you have uh, this is an example that we commonly use. If we have, if we're all in this room, like a different type of cookie, we can live along, we don't need to compete. But if we like the same kind of cookie, and I'm a, uh, I have a weapon, I can produce an antibiotic, I would have to kill all of you so you don't need my cookies, <laughs> right? So how can we find this, um, the, the factors that drive this nutrient competition and at the same time can reach or select for more preferred or um, uh, preferred resources um, with the idea that perhaps we can find the, the conditions that would have reached um, antagonistic phenotypes in the population, which is a characteristic that um, commonly, a common characteristic of, of soils that have um, a suppressive condition for a particular path. So, with the idea of 
greater nutrient competition, more in need, more antagonism, and more suppression eventually for, for pathogens. So what are, what are we trying to do is learn what, or see what we can learn from streptomyces interactions to then use that knowledge for, um, specifically for the, the to select for antagonism for pathogens from those native communities. So we did this work in soil mesoplasmas, which are nothing other than a glass jar with soil. Um, we collect soil from an agricultural field that has a long history of potato production. So there has been, um, this, this soil has also been a source of previous studies where uh, antagonistic streptomyces have been isolated. Um, so we, we collect soil, we establish this misocosms, and for the next nine months, we amended the misocosms with different carbon sources, whether it was glucose, fructose, or a mixture. And we also have the, the non-amended control. So we fed the, the soil with, with the sh these carbon sources for nine months. We selected uh, or isolated streptomyces from these jars from each different treatment, and then we characterize this uh, streptomyces populations for their nutrient use profiles using biologic plates that provide 95 different carbon sources, so we can see which of these 95 carbon sources that um, each isolate grows on, which ones are preferred, and which, which ones are shared among the coexisting uh, individual or uh, isolates. We also did, uh, we studied the incubatory capacities or profiles of this isolates, <coughs> looking at all possible pairwise um, interactions, meaning that each isolate for out of this, this collection was tested to see which one killed, whether they killed e e each other or which ones killed um, which. So this is some of the results, and this is an NMDS, which is a, um, non-metric multidimensional scale plot, which what it really means is each um, point or each asterisk and, and each uh, symbol represent uh, is, uh, isolate. So isolates in this kind of plot, isolates that are more close together mean that they are more similar to each other. What we have here is the all the nutrient use profiles based on the 95 uh, carbon sources. So whether they use similar things where they didn't use the same thing, that is what came into this, this plot. So things that are just farther away are more different, things that are closer together are more similar. So you can see that in general, the, there was a greater variability in the non-amended uh, community, while the addition of carbon sources really select for more uh, less variable communities that closer together have more similar nutrient use uh, profiles. So suggesting that these, mm -hmm. the addition of these nutrients to the soil um, actually played a role selecti selectively enriching uh, specific populations with that have um, distinct nutrient use profiles from the broad range of the non-amended community. And then when we look at the, the per niche overlap which what it means is the fraction, so if you look at this, if you imagine these are two different isolates, so what is the fraction of the total probe of two different isolates that actually came from nutrients that both of, of the two isolates share? So what were the two nutrients that both of them, or both isolates were actually growing on? So we did that for all possible pairwise interactions and we found that isolates from the carbon amendment treatments also have larger niche overlap compared with isolates from <coughs> the control, meaning that um, the amendment soil also reduce niche differentiation, which means that they have greater niche overlap. Uh, so they eat more, they eat more similar things, and that might also lead or suggest that there is more nutrient competition for, for two sides. When we look at the inhibitory capacities or profiles of this isolate, what we saw is that carbon amendments actually impose selection for increased frequencies of inhibitors. So carbon additions act resulted in 
uh, increases in, in the percent of indigenous streptomyces that were inhibitory towards other streptomyces. So we were able to see that there were great, more isolates from those amended jars tended to kill other, other streptomyces compared with isolates from the control. And when we look at, try to put together the nutrient and the inhibition data, so this plot has the inhibition zone, which means the, how big the, the inhibition was, which is a, a reflect of, of the amount of, perhaps the amount of antibiotics that are being produced or how, what, how antagonistic that particular isolate is against the, uh, the other isolate. So we look at how big the, the zone size were versus the niche overlap, which again represents that shared nutrient. And what this plot is telling you is that isolates from the carbon amendment soils tend to kill more intensively things that they share nutrients with. So if, if you eat the same things that I do, I would most likely kill you over more. The, there is a great intensity of how I will kill you if you're eating the same food that I, that I eat. However, we didn't see that in the control. Meaning that, so there was a, this selection in, uh, that the carbon remnants contribute to select for this population, but again, there were not only more inhibitors, but they were actually more inhibitory towards nutrient competitors. Which we believe that, um, so in, just as, as, as kind of, of a summary, if we think about it, these communities that are in the soil at streptomyces, native at streptomyces communities, we didn't inoculate these soil. These were communities that were already there. If you think about it, they were, the, in, what we saw in the control is that they had greater uh, nutrient use variability, they used, they used different uh, nutrients, they were also, they <coughs> used different things, but also used uh, um, they, they were less less similar, there was more variability. There was also more variability in the inhibitory capacity that even though we saw less densities of inhibitors, inhibitors in the non-amended control, we also saw a broad range of uh, inhibitory capacity, meaning that some isolates were what we call super killers that kill a ton of other isolates, but we also saw a lot of isolates that were not inhibitory well, in the um, the carbon amendments, on the other hand, we um, <coughs> we suggest that these these carbon amendments actually represent selective events or selective funnels that actually um, select for a specific population that has more similar nutrient use profiles. They also have more uh, increase in niche overlap, meaning that they grow more on just uh, shared nutrients <coughs> that enrich. This uh, selective events also enrich densities of inhibitors, but in this case, even though we saw more inhibitors, they were also where they have more what we call modest inhibitory activity. We didn't see the super killer uh, phenotype that we saw in the control that kill so many uh, different isolates, but instead we saw isolates that kill a more narrow range of isolates. But at the same time, they were more, uh, they were they had greater density to these isolates. Um, and there was an accumulation of resistance also for in those, in those uh, populations. So, and just for the, the last part of the, my talk, this is the other project that I've been working on where we're looking at uh, the effect of, of management strategies on uh, potato crop yields and soil health, in particular, what is the role of, uh, in combination with fumigated <coughs> with uh, soil fumigation, and what is the effect that they have on soil microbial community? This is a joint project that we're doing with our colleagues from NDSU and uh, Carl Rosen from the Soil uh, Science Department at UW uh, in uh, Minnesota. So, just as a background, soilborne diseases and potato are a major challenge that there's not enough or a, a great variety of uh, resistant varieties, uh, potato varieties that are resistant for this pathogen. Diseases build upon even with rotation. Um, potato growers don't grow potato 
uh, after potato, there's, they're always grown on a crop rotation with soy or, or corn. However, every time they plant uh, potato, they have to fumigate as the only strategy that they have to control the soil corn pathogens. And the fumigation is costly, it represents a big chunk of, of their, of their um, budget. And it also has a lot of environmental uh, consequences, including non-target effects, where they eliminate not only the pathogenic communities or, or pathogens in the soil, but also the beneficial microbes in that soil. And what they describe as a fumigation treadmill that uh, um, says that if you fumigate once, then you, the next, every time that you would plant potato, you would have to fumigate, otherwise you, uh, you won't be able to uh, get a yield out of this. So fumigation is a very commonly and widely used strategy for potato in potato production. So our, the objectives for this study is to characterize the, the interactive effect of fumigation with nutrient, in, uh, nutrient amendments and microbial inoculants on potato yields, diseases, and the soil microbiome composition and uh, functional characteristics with the idea um, to also see what are, what are the, the differences that we see in this microbiome and the cell microbiome, what are the effects they're having or that it might have on yields and diseases. And the ideal goal is to, to find um, whether these soil um, management strategies can contribute to or facilitate the reestablishment of this community. That if you think when you take an antibiotic the doctor recommend you take yogurt, right, to reestablish this population. So what we're looking at is what are the conditions that actually can facilitate the reestablishment of healthy um, soil communities of mainly um, form of, of beneficial plant growth for other populations that actually can reduce the, the frequency and dependency that growers have on uh, fumigation. So we have this, um, uh, this, this ongoing project that we established at, at Becker, Minnesota, which is in the Sandy Plains uh, area of Minnesota, the main uh, potato growing area in the, um, in the uh, upper Midwest. We have, uh, this is a study, we have, uh, we started with a uh, soybean, uh, soybean, with plants in soybean, and then we, we, we fumigate, plant corn, uh, soybean, uh, potato, and then corn every year for two years. Um, the fumigation treatments were non, as well as bacon and chlorpicrin. Bacon is the traditional product of methane sodium, sodium that has been used traditionally in, uh, in potato production. And chlorpicrin, which is an, uh, a newer chemistry that is being introduced or, or, or provided to the potato grower. It, um, it has been widely used in strawberry and uh, uh, other uh, crop production, but not in potato. And in combination with different nitrogen fertilized fertilization uh, those to so just to give you an uh, overview of the results in terms of yields what we saw is that in general fumigation increase yields um, in nitrogen increasing doses of nitrogen up to 180 pounds per acre actually have a have an effect increasing yield but after that those actually the, the addition of extra nitrogen didn't result in the increases in yield, the, the actually the yields tended to plateau or in some cases even decrease. And one of the reasons of why adding more nitrogen, even though that's what the industry has been trying to, to promote among uh, growers, what we see is that uh, adding more nitrogen actually delays the senescence of the crop. If you think of potatoes, they're called crop, their whole plant has to die and all these resources go into the main sink, which is the, the tuber. So the longer you have a live plant, the, the less resources that are moving into the, the tuber. So we didn't, we didn't see a, actually a, a benefit of adding more, more nitrogen there. And we actually, when looking at potato um, tuber diseases, we said that both fumigation um, treatments reduce potatoes, uh, common scab, and rhizotonic corky disease, which are two of the main uh, tuber diseases. And particularly the chlorpicrin was effective uh, controlling potato scab, which is the main pathogen of, of potato that causes this 
this pins uh, is a, a cosmetic uh, feature, but it's the, the most limiting um, um, cosmetic factor of, or, or a limiting factor of in potato production because uh, it affects the, the appearance of the tour. And so when we we look, we also look at uh, uh, other diseases. We and we said that fumigation also reduced um, verticillin wilt, which is a, a fungal pathogen that infects the plants through the, the roots, but actually the symptoms are not in the potato tubers, it actually affects the, the, the plant uh, and reduces the, 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 the tuber production. So in working with our colleagues from the soil science department, what we look at is the, some of the, the, the soil community uh, characterization and they, in, in the soil health um, research group, some of the work that they've been doing is using this um, Solvita CO2 burst uh, test. And I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with this test. It's, it's a, um, commonly is it's commonly used by uh, crop consultants. And what it measures is CO2 in the soil, which is um, uh, reflects the, um, the microbial activity in the soil or the respiration in that in that soil with the idea that more CO2 respiration, more microbial activity, and supposedly greater um, fertility, the, 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 the soil, more soil health or fertility in that particular. So what we saw is that it started at a, what is considered medium soil health uh, level based on the microbial activity, based considering that these are sandy soil, <coughs> sandy soils that are, have very low um, organic matter. They started and they imme immediately the fumigation by planting has reduced significantly the microbial activity in that soil, which eventually started building up again to or, or rebound to uh, to the point of the of the harvest. However, this test, <coughs> as you would think, is not it's only telling you what is the activity that is there, but not the activity of good or bad. Microbes, right? So we don't we didn't, don't know if the having um, increasing the activity is that increasing the activity because the pop, the pathogenic populations are increasing or the, the good microbes are increasing. But it, um, let alone it's, it's a it's been interesting to also collaborate with our, our colleagues and, and learn of some of these other um, tools that they're using. And when we look at um, we're also been doing amplicon sequencing. So this is a uh, principal uh, component analysis, similar to the NMDS that I showed you before. If you see each dot represent a soil sample, it's dots that are more closer together are more similar to each other compared to the ones that are more spread. Um, so here on the left, we have bacterial soil microbiomes at a harvest, and you can see that the communities, like yellow being the non-fumigated community, we see that the chloropicrin community was not, was significant, was different than the community, than the other two communities. Particularly, the, the bay plant is more similar to the control, but it's still, there, was, there wasn't not a full reestablishment in those communities to what the, they used to look like in the non communicated treatment. And that difference was even more dramatic for the fungal communities that we observed from the, this soil, uh, Fumigated soils. So when we're looking at this data right now, this is an ongoing project. We're looking at the community soils. What we're looking is that whether this changes in the um, in this soil microbial communities have an effect on um, that that reduction in the soil-borne pathogens or, or, or tuber diseases that we're seeing uh, in the field, and whether. This, uh, the effect of reducing the, the diseases comes just from the fumigation killing the pathogen, or is it a res result of the changes in the soil community? And the last part, the, the other uh, experiment that we're in, in, in association with that fumigation trial, what we're looking is at whether amending microbial or whether adding microbial inoculants or, or carbon amendments to that fumigated soil actually in, uh, help with the establishment of that um, of this community. Kind of this is the the yogurt idea of 
are we actually helping to reestablish this community? And for, for that, we're using streptomyces that have been isolated from uh, suppressive potato scab suppressive soils from Minnesota, so they're, they're local uh, isolates. And we're adding this microbial inoculant, we're growing this inoculant on uh, rice as a nutrient source, but also as a vehicle to deliver this uh, uh, inoculant. And what we see is that if you look at the, on the left, it's the non-fumigated plug, um, which saw a significant effect of the combination of, of carbon amendments with microbial inoculants in the non-fumigated plug. When we look at the fumigated with chloropicrine, we really don't see uh, an uh, actually an effect of, of the fumigation in this, this particular um, trial in terms of potato disease if you compare the non-amended into on both sizes. But what we see is that actually the fumigation enhanced the, um, the, the impact of, the, of controlling the potato scab that we observe in this, in this plot. So just see that in particular, the combination of adding those inoculants and the food for those microbes actually can perhaps, this is preliminary data, but this is just that perhaps it could eventually uh, represent an alternative for, for fumigation uh, or that start uh, reducing the dependency on uh, fumigated cells. This is an ongoing uh, study and as you can imagine with this winter, last year we, we planted April 15th, last Thursday this was how the field looked, there was still soil on the ground, the soil was still frozen, so that it actually is going to delay our um, our plots, which also might, we might also see some, some variation just because of, of how uh, crazy the weather is, but, but, um, but it still will, we're going to continue this year. Just as a summary, fumigation in a increased yield and reduced potato diseases, the optimal nitrogen um, concentrate or uh, fertilizer rate was um, higher in non-fumigated versus in, in fumigated, meaning that if you don't fum if you fumigate, maybe you don't need to add as much nitrogen as in the non-fumigated plot. So bacteria and fungal microbiomes change dramatically from pre-fumigation and pre-planting to harvest. The microbial activity was reduced, but again, the CO2 burst doesn't tell us or doesn't differentiate between pathogenic or non-pathogenic. And the fumigation treatment also results in very different microbiomes which at this point also is not telling us necessarily whether they are more pathogenic or not. We are still working on the taxonomy classification of those um, microbiomes. And just last, in the last few minutes, I just wanna invite you to please um, contact me if you're interested in being part of the, uh, in this community of uh, agricultural microbiome that we are building. We are, this is an NSF supported Grant, and we are launching the RCN at ICCP meeting with a workshop that we have a great uh, list of, of invited speakers. The workshop is going to be very dynamic. It's going to make it's going to uh, have some lighting talks and also some um, panel discussion and, and breakout sessions, as well as there are opportunities for early career um, scientists, including including both faculty and. and postdocs and students, if you have any questions, please email me or email Lindy Kinko. And I wanna just to make a plot that Winbit is actually part of the steering committee of this project and she's been um, a great uh, asset in the organiza organization of this uh, workshop. So if you also have any questions about the art thing, you could ask uh, Wim. Or visit the ag microbiome rcn.uom.edu if you have. Uh, also, and please join the mailing list that you will find. With that, I would thank. Would like to thank the people in, in the Kinko lab, some of the students that I've been, I have mentor and that have helped me to collect some of the data and some of the funding sources. So with that, I, will, I don't know if I have time, but I'll take as many questions.
be affecting the antibiotic production. I'm wondering if this is direct or indirect. Is there a correlation between Streptomyces species and the diversity or the broad spectrum of antibiotic production? Is that species related or are, are antibiotic is, um, production determinants being spread around by plasmids? So it's not tied to who they are. So you mean in the production of, uh, anti of a specific antibiotic compound? Yeah, and the spectrum. So, so you were finding that in the, in the, the unamended soil, you have more organisms that have broad spectrum. Is mm -hmm. that because they're a particular species or because that's a particular phenotype? So the, that's a, the, the question is whether the, the variation that we see is because of different, um, different species. We haven't completed that, that, that project, the, the phenotypic characterization, based on some of the previous work that has been done in the lab from uh, uh, native prairies, they've, they've seen, um, they haven't seen a necessarily a, a, a correlation with different species, but, but more uh, different, different phenotypes from, even from the same, same species. That being said, we still don't have really a good technology or a good way to measure the different types of antibiotics that they are producing. Um, in the soil, we could, we we base our, um, our our assets are based on what the production of antibiotics in general, whether they are inhibitory or not, but not whether they're producing A, B, or C because you eat X, Y, and Z carbon. We're still not uh, doing that. Yet. And you don't actually know if they're producing one that kills a lot or a lot of antibiotics. That's that's a, a really good question. We haven't we haven't tested that hypothesis of whether they are producing different antib antibiotics or whether they're producing a lot of one single thing. We hope that eventually, with more uh, development and more techniques, especially with <coughs> mass spec, um, we we would be able to have a better uh, better idea of what are actually some of those secondary metabolites that are being produced. We have some of the the whole genome sequencing. Um, the data that is telling us some of those um, pathways and some of those genes that might be present in some species and other ones, but still we don't know in the soil whether they are actually producing all of those. Any questions? Uh, so why were those uh, carbon forms were selected, like the fructose, the glucose, how were those supposed to reflect? There's, there was glucose, fructose, and those. Yeah. Like what, what was the difference between like, glucose and fructose? So it's the question of why, why do you, did we pick fructose and glucose in particular? Yeah. yeah. There wasn't really uh, much of, of, of a thought process in terms of we were looking for the most simple carbon sources that we know are present in root exudate. We are doing some other work with testing other uh, carbon sources. We have test, we've tested um, have more uh, recalcitrant carbon sources, but these ones were more of the ones that we wanted to see, the ones that are available right away for all the microbes that are there, if they can still use it, um, as opposed to be more selective for the more kind of like case strategy uh, microbes in, in the soil. Further questions? So when, when you had your OVITA test and you had a decline in activity and an increase, have, are you looking into what communities increased? I mean, do you know if it's electromyces? Not, well, we are coupling that. So the way it works is we collect the same soil samples. Um, some of, part of the, the sample goes to the microbiome characterization, part of the sample goes to the, uh, for the OVITA test. So we would be able to act to to couple those those results from the Solvita test. I didn't have a um, query. Just maybe I think maybe I got oh no here. The the test doesn't really tell you more about what is in there. It just you add you have your soil sample and then you have this. Um, plastic thing that actually measures the amount of carbon of CO2, so you see a columet colometric um, change in, in that piece based on the amount of CO2 that then you measure with that. With that.
with that machine. So it's actually very useful for crop consultants because they can do that in the field, kind of like more like a uh, real time kind of uh, approach. Um, but it, it doesn't tell you anything of if it's one thing or, or it's a whole community. <coughs> But you will have that information. We will, we, for our project, we will, because we uh, purposely collect the same sample for both tests. Okay. I have a technical question. So when you're looking for the uh, microbes associated with the potatoes, um, how did you take those soils and were they just generically from the field or were you trying to like pull the potatoes out and like gently try to like take off like rhizosphere sort of? Depending on, on when we are, the, the different times that we're collecting soil samples uh, along the, 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 um, the season. So we collect before fumigation, we collect at planting, uh, and, and then several times before uh, in the mid season. And then at harvest, at harvest we collect both rhizosphere, um, um, rhizosphere samples, and also we collect bulk soil samples. So we kind of shake the, the, the plants and collect that more of a rhizosphere sample, and then we also collect soil that was not attached to the plant. Other questions? No? Thank you.